If you have your iPad, turn with me with your iPad. If you've got your phone, get on your phone. It's all right. You know what? There's a Bible on this phone. I've got a Bible app. It's just as good as one that's written in print. Well, however you speak, or the Lord speaks to you, you grab it. We welcome electronic devices. It's all right. It's good. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute, too. We live in a Google world and not a Gutenberg world. You say, who in the world is Gutenberg? He was the one that uh, invented the printing press. He was the one that started printing up things way long time ago, and he was the one that started printing the Bibles to distribute out to the people. He did it in a very simple way. He allowed us to be able to read left to right in a rational, logical, linear way. But guess what? In today's world, we live in a Google world. Chuck Swindoll was at Liberty University not too long ago. And if you've ever been in their convocation center, it's a huge center. It sets probably 10,000 or more. And he goes up and he tells, the, he tells the students, grab your Bible. You know what? If you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a printed copy of the Bible, then you're missing out. And he went on for five minutes about the printed Bible. He said, grab your Bibles. Grab them. And one of the kids up front says, I've got my Bible right here on my phone. And it stopped him dead in his tracks. And he said, I apologize. He said, you see, because I'm from the older generation. He said, I'm from the old school. You know, we were always taught to bring our Bibles and to have paper copies of everything. But I understand that you have your Bible on your phones or on your iPads or whatever electronic device that it may be. You see, we live in a Google world this day and age. It's the age of electronics. There's nothing wrong with this world. Some prefer paper. That's all right. Some prefer uh, electronics. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's all right either way. And this morning we're going to talk a little bit about capturing communities for Christ. And part of capturing communities for Christ is change, whether we like it or not. In capturing communities for Christ, we must remember that methods change, but the principles never do. You see, that's the whole thing. Methods change, but the principles never do. What, does it, what are the principles? The principles are the Word of God, and they are in the Word of God, whether that's on the phone or whether it's in a written Bible, one of the two. The principles are still there. We have to look around, we have to examine our methods and see if they're still valid or not. What do I mean by that? Methods used 50 years ago aren't necessarily valid today. Let me give you a few examples. How about door-to-door -door evangelism? In this day and age, door-to-door -door evangelism has gone way down on, on the wayside. Why is that? You go into subdivisions, out in the subdivisions, you've got signs on the subdivision that says, no soliciting. Not only that, but if you go up and you knock on somebody's door, you can be hurt. You can be shot this day and age. Really and truly. You see, it's not like it used to be 50 years ago. This day and age, people don't want you to come and knock on their door. They don't want you to come and invade their space. How about crusade evangelism? Billy Graham Crusades, Crusades Evangelism. Crusade Evangelism is dying in the United States. Why is it? Because there's other methods in there. In third world countries, in poorer countries where they don't have the media aspect of it and everything, it's still going. But in the United States, Crusade Evangelism is really decreasing in what it needs in its purposes. Today's methods include media churches, 
101 evangelism, church planning, multi-site churches. That's where it is today. We don't like to hear that. Why? Because that's not the world that we grew up in. We don't like to hear about multi-site churches or other churches coming into our community and planning other churches. We don't like it. But there's a reason behind it. One question that always has bothered me badly was this one. And I'm just sharing my heart this morning. Why are other churches being planted around other churches? Why are there churches from Charlotte coming into our areas and planting other churches? You ever think about it? What's up with these satellite churches coming in and planting a church within five miles of an existing church or maybe two miles? What's up with that? And the answer being is because the original churches lag behind and they don't meet the needs of the community. That's the truth of the matter. You see, churches don't want to change. They want to stay the same as they were 40 or 50 years ago. They don't want to meet the needs of the community around them. So these other churches who understand where everything's going, they come in and they plant a church. Now, is there something wrong with that? No, because there's needs in a community. Even around this church here, there's pockets of lost people that aren't being reached. If you do the demographics, there's pockets of lost people, even within a five-mile radius of this church, that aren't being reached. Why is it? That's a good question. That's a question we should ask of ourselves. You see, churches don't want to change. They're, they're in their comfort zone. They, they forget about the community around them as it moves forward. You see, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what Waxhaw does. Progress is going to happen. You know, people don't like what's going on in Waxhaw. There's too many buildings. They're changing the area. There's, there, there's all kinds. Of, that's progress. You see, in the church of Jesus Christ... The one who wants to capture the community for Christ understands that as the community changes, so does the churches. Think about all the churches just within three to five miles of us. And think about why these other churches from Charlotte came in and planted churches around them. This week I took a class with Dr. Elmer Towns. Dr. Elmer Towns founded Liberty University with Jerry Falwell. He's 85 years old. He's been a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church for more than 30 years. And he said, you know what, I don't care much for loud music at church. He said, I just don't really care for it. He said, it's loud, you know, my, my hearing is kind of sensitive. However, when I look out in the crowd of young people worshiping the Lord, I can't help but praise God. He said, I sit down there at Thomas Road Baptist Church, and he said, 10,000 people's in there, and, and, and music's going loud. And he said, do I like it? Not particularly. But he said, I look over to my left, and there's 18 to 20-year-olds praising God. He said, I look over here, and he said, there's 18 to 25-year-olds praising God, tears flowing down their eyes. He said, you know what? It's not about me. It's about what God's doing in other people's lives. <laughs> 85 years old. He said, you know what? He said, I teach a Sunday school class of 150 every Sunday when I'm there. 150 people come to my Sunday school class. He said, I've got one crotch of the old man. <laughs> he said, all he does is complain about the music. All he does is complain about what's going on. He said, he won't even sit in the worship service. He goes out to his car to listen to the worship service because he can't stand the music. He said, you know what? That man's heart's not right. That man's heart's not right. Why is it? Because he can't see what God's doing 
in and among the church. God's working in and among the church, but all he cares about is what he wants. He said, I worship with them because the young generation is worshiping the Lord. You see, that's more important than what my want is. That young people's coming to the church. That young people's understanding who Jesus Christ is. That young people is worshiping the Lord. That's what it's all about. The next generation coming and worshiping the Lord. Methods change, but principles never do. Jesus is the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be tomorrow. See, that's, that's a principle. He never changes. Methods change. The message never changes. We don't change the message for the culture. We may change some methods to going after to, to draw people in, but the message stays the same. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. To capture communities for Christ, we have to be open what the Lord's doing around us. We have to look around and say, what's God doing around us? You see, it's not about these eight walls in this church or four walls in another church. It's not about what he's doing in here. It's about what are we supposed to be doing out there. That's what it's all about. Yes, the church comes together. Yes, we're supposed to equip people in the church. We're supposed to train them. We're supposed to train them what they believe and why they believe it. Why? So that they can go out into the communities and capture the community for Jesus Christ. That's what the church is all about. Yes, we worship. But, you know, the church comes and gathers one, usually one day a week, maybe twice, Sunday and Wednesday. And then what happens the other five days? The church scatters. And when the church scatters, then the church should be out in the community, capturing the community for Jesus Christ. See, God has a plan to bring people to him. And it's called the church. That's his plan. You come in, you see God plan the world, perfect. Man said, heck with this, I don't want to even go that way, and he chose to disobey. God said, okay, I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to do it through animal sacrifices at this point in time, or having faith in me. Trust in me. Then he came in and his other plan was, you know what, I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary for your sins, for my sins, and the world's sins. He's the only way. He's the truth. And he's the life. He's going to cover your sins. And when he covers your sins and his work on the cross is done, he's going to be buried. And for three days, he's going to be in the grave. And on the third day, he's going to be raised again. And that's exactly what he's done. But you see, he wasn't through yet. He had another plan, and that plan was called the church. The church started at Pentecostal. The church and the nation of Israel are two different entities. The church isn't Israel, and Israel isn't the church. And he had this plan that after Jesus' ascension, there would be a group of people that would come together and be known as the church. And the church, who is full of the Holy Spirit, full of the believers, full of the ones who have trusted Him and have received the gift of eternal life and has received the gift of the Holy Spirit, then goes out into the world to tell others about Him. But not only tell others about him, but to gather them up and come and worship him. Not to stay the same, but to go out and capture communities. 
How are we capturing for Christ the communities that we live in and work in on a daily basis? Church, how are we capturing the community of, of Waxhaw? How are, we, how are we capturing it? You think just coming on Sunday that that's the way we capture it? Maybe Wednesdays. You know, I've done my thing, and I don't have to worry about it until next week. How are we capturing the community for Christ? How are you capturing the community that you live in on a daily basis? Whether that's at work. You say, oh, Chris, there's no way we can have church at work. Sure there is. I used to do it all the time when I worked for the county. We'd have Bible study. We'd have prayer time. We'd worship the Lord. How am I capturing people around me? We used to do it at lunch hour. We had people coming in who were thirsting for the word, who wanted to know more, and we'd have church for an hour at lunchtime. Capturing your community around you, capturing the community around the church in which we are a part of. In the book of Acts, we see something new. We see a church forming. We see God's plan unveiling. We see his bride ever expanding. Each time, Luke gives us a progress report. 5,000 men came to know the Lord. Well, that was just men. That was just men. You see, when Luke says there are 5,000 that, that came to Christ, he wasn't counting the women and the children. You see, there was a potential when you read things like that, there's a potential of having 20,000 people, 30,000 people coming to Christ. Part of God's plan in the book of Acts is to plant churches, plant churches, plant churches in unevangelized communities. When the gospel is preached, people come to trust in Jesus Christ, and a beautiful thing happens. That beautiful thing is called the church. Beauty. Why wouldn't we be beautiful? We're his bride. It's been so long ago since you watched your bride walk down the aisle. Or maybe you're looking forward to that because you're single. Beautiful. I can still remember when I turned over at Bethlehem Methodist Church and I saw Laura walking down the aisle. I teared up. That's what happens when a church is planted. When the bride is planted, God is overjoyed. God is there and he wants to take that, that church and he wants to make it beautiful in the community. It, it, it's just like a flower. It's just like a bo blossoming flower. That's what he wants to do with it. A body of believers are formed, and that body of believers are called a church. The biggest church in the world is in Seoul, Korea. Seoul, Korea's church has 750,000 members. The pastor of the church has a main mother church that seats maybe 10 to 15,000. All the rest of them are home churches. You see, they do church differently than what we do over here. You see, where we might frown upon, oh, I can't believe they have a home church. Do they just meet on Sunday? If they don't meet on Sundays, then it's not a church. No, they meet throughout the week, whatever week it is. You see, it's an underground church, even in China. China has the largest underground church in the world. What happens in the underground church? Believers come, and there's maybe five that starts. They come, and they go into the apartment building, and they start worshiping God in a 10 or 12 or 15-story apartment building. Outside, there's 10 or 12 bikes up against the building. The police come, and they see the bikes. And they see that there's something happening. They go up to the 14th floor. They knock on the apartment door. They hear the singing. They hear the worship. They break in. 
they pull the guy out that's leasing the apartment and they make everybody leave and the guy can't even go back into his apartment building the lease is broken he's kicked out on the street guess what happens three more home churches are started because of that you see they're taking their communities for Christ it's amazing the way church is done they're persecuted they're kicked out <laughs> and three more houses three more churches are started I want you to think about that I want you to think about that when Christ is preached in the community and a church is planted evangelism happens and souls come to Christ that's where evangelism is going in the western part or the western part of the world in the United States you see, the new method of evangelism is going into unevangelized areas and planting churches. Why not? Why not? How else can you get them over there? Go into their community and capture it for Jesus Christ. The church then equips her members to learn how to share the gospel, and the members then go out and they share the message of the good news. Many times then a church plants another church into a community who needs the gospel. It grows. It's called multiplication. Now what has happened in the community in which we're in? Why, do, why have all these other churches come in to plant these churches and these other churches? It's because the churches were lagging behind. They weren't keeping up. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They weren't presenting the gospel the way that they were supposed to be presenting the gospel. That's just plain truth, folks. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether I want to admit it or not, I found the answer this week because that was on my heart. Why are they all coming in here? It's because the churches didn't want to change. They didn't want to change their methods. They didn't want to go after the generation that's coming up who like the iPads, who like the phones, who like the PowerPoints, whatever it may be. So guess what? A church that had that idea and who understand what church was all about did. And they come in and they meet that group. And they meet that need and people come to Christ. Or the church never was preaching the gospel to begin with. A lot of times that happens. You go into a community and you think, man, there's 16 churches in this community. Are any of them really preaching the word? Are any of them really going through and teaching people the word of God? There's a number of reasons of why it happens. Look in verses 13 and 14. We're looking at two verses this morning. Chapter 13. You remember Barnabas and Saul and Paul have fasted with the church. They prayed. God sent them out. They started on their journey. They went to several different places. Talking to people about Christ. And actually planting churches as they're going away and going on along in their journey. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. You may want to underline that if you can. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Don't really know why John left them. We'll talk a little bit about that in the coming weeks. But it could be that he just didn't want to go on. He didn't like what he was seeing. Could have been too dangerous. There's a lot of different things. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisi um, Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue. And they went down. See what happened? They went into the synagogue. And they sat down. You see, we see in these verses something new is about to happen. Paul and Barnabas is on a mission 
to plant churches in the new territory. Now, there's already a synagogue there. There's already a synagogue. You know, there's a Jewish worship center right there. But they've got something new. They've got something different. They've got something that they want to tell folks about God's plan. And they arrived there in Antioch. And they started capturing the community for Christ. You see, it was one of the first uh, communities they went in to capture. It was, a, it was a familiar one. You see, if you go back a few verses, you'll see that they went to Barnabas' hometown first in Cyprus. They went to capture that community first. They planted the church, and then they took the community for Christ there. So God allowed them to build a church there. And then they came to this place. It wasn't an easy journey. You see, it never is with God. Journeys are never easy. There's always mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. And where this place was located, it was a dangerous journey up the mountain. And some say that's why John Martin didn't want to go with them. And that's why he returned home. It was a rough journey. It's never an easy journey when you want to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the devil's always sitting there, and he's always trying to roadblock. He's always trying to put obstacles up. Because the last thing he wants to do is for the church to be successful. The last thing he wants to do is see another church come in and being planted, that is, uh, preaching Jesus Christ and the word, and people's coming. What he likes to see is churches or worship centers that just stay idle, that don't want to do anything, that don't want to reach out, whatever that may be. In our daily bread, they had an article that said a missionary in Africa was once asked if he really liked what he was doing. He was response, his response was shocking. Do I like this work? He said, no. My wife and I do not like dirt. We have reasonable, refined sensibilities. We don't like crawling in vile huts through goat uh, refuse. But is a man to do nothing for Christ... He does not like. God pity him. If not, liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go, and we go. Love constrains us. Church, you see, that's the whole thing about it is the church has orders to go. That is the will of God. The will of God is to go make disciples, whether that's two miles down the road or whether that's 500 miles to the northeast or the northwest. It's not what we like. It's being obedient in going. Yet when they arrived at this location, they found solid ground. What did they find? They went into a synagogue. Hey, Paul and Barnabas knew what that was all about. They were Jewish. They, they, they knew what the worship center was all about. It was a familiar place. Why was it a familiar place? Because it was the Jewish central location of everything that happened. We said the church ought to be the central of the community. People ought to be able to be able to come here when they can't go anywhere else. And these Jewish communities were in all the big cities. You could call them a franchise. Right? We all know what franchises are. How about Chick-fil-A? You go to Chick-fil-A, they're all the same. Right? Yep, you know what to expect. You know what type of food that you're going to get. Whatever it is, McDonald's. A lot of times, even Southern Baptist churches, you can go in and you know, because that's why a lot of people come to a church that they know about, because they can understand the order of the service. And, you know, or it could be any church like that. You see, the synagogue was the center of the Jewish community. It was a place of worship. It's where the education center was, the judicial center, the social gathering place. It was a great place to start because of the fact 
of knowing the buzz around the community and being comfortable in it. So that's why they went there. Paul and Barnabas is about to plant a church near a synagogue, folks, in the same community, maybe within a few hundred yards from that existing synagogue, or maybe with us within a few hundred yards of an existing church. A whole new concept to people. A whole new truth and hope to reach people for Christ. Timothy Keller, in an article he wrote, said, Church societies have to maintain vigorous, extensive church planning just to stay Christian. Why is it? Because there's a lot of churches that are out there that are existing that aren't Christian churches whether you want to believe that or whether I want to believe it. One church, no matter how big, will never be able to serve the needs of such a diverse city. Only a movement of hundreds of churches, small and large, can penetrate literally every neighborhood and people group in the city. Even here in Waxhaw, even here in Indian Land, even here in the Lancaster community, there are lost pockets of people. And we're here to partner with God to spread the truth of Jesus Christ to those lost pockets. Where is it that we as Waxhaw Baptist Church might be able to plant a church to reach more people for Christ? Where is it? Where is it? It could be local or it could be far away. You see, after taking this class with Dr. Towns, I can tell you my view about church plants has taken a radically different view. Radically different. See, because I understand what it's all about. I understand that there's churches that want to meet the needs of the community that don't mind changing with, with the community, but the message is the same. God's opened my eyes to a very important way to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Church, look around this place we call WBC. Look inside your heart. What is it all about? Is it about you and about the way that you want to do church? Or is it about God and the way God intends us to do church? Is it about our community in which we live in, or is it about our church? Are we taking this community for Christ? And if we are, how are we doing it? How can we do it better? How can our methods change, but not our methods? Do we really care about it? Or are we just in it for ourselves? You see, we don't really care if we reach people for Christ just as long as it's just the way we are. This is the way we are. This is the way we've always been. This is the way I'm used to doing church. So I don't really want to change about it. You see, and when we have that attitude like that, then we can't capture our community for Christ. And the sad reality is, is that there will be a church that comes in who may be half a mile down the road who will. Where's your community this morning? Where's your community this morning? Where's Wax Baptist Church's community this morning? Only you can answer that. As we come to this time of invitation, you know what? I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to think about. But those two verses had a lot of truth in them. Where's your heart this morning? Where's your heart this morning? Is your heart with you? Is your heart with what you want? Or is your heart with God? Because he's the focus of it. To go out and reach Jesus Christ, or to go out and reach people for Jesus Christ, we've got to have our focus on Him. 
We've got to be able to have our education on him. We've got to be able to have our relationships with him to be able to do the things that we're wanting to do. Right where you're seated, seated at. Well, in this hymn of invitation, if you don't come to the altar, that's fine. If you would love to, come and let's pray about this. But if you choose to sit right where you're at, I want you to put your hand right there on that seat that you're sitting on. And I want you to pray that God would bring some lost person to the 11 o'clock service. Or that God would set somebody in that seat that you're sitting in at the 8.30 service. And that he would bring them in to hear the love of Jesus Christ. And to understand what the community of a church is supposed to be. To be able to have them understand that they can be equipped here at Waxhaw Baptist Church. I want you to do that. I want you to continue to pray and fast with me about what's happening over these next several weeks and these next several months. Because I can tell you through the spiritual warfare that has been going on, not only in my life, these past couple months, that God's getting ready to do a great thing here. He, he's getting ready to do a great thing at Waxhaw Baptist Church. Otherwise, Satan wouldn't be all over me like he is. And I've seen it. I've experienced it. I continue to experience it. But my focus is on him. It's not on the devil. So as Sandy and the musicians come, you do whatever you need to do this morning. You, however God is talking to you this morning, however and whatever he says that you need to do, you do it. Be obedient. Be obedient. I'm here if you need to talk with me. I'll be glad to talk with you about how to accept Christ, about what you need to do about church, whatever's on your heart. I'm here. You want to join the church? Come and talk to me. We'll talk about it. We'll see where you're at, what you're wanting to do. It's a great journey. This is the, we're, we've been on a great journey for many, many months.